Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations. Ken Langone, co-founder of Home Depot in 1978, rose from humble beginnings to become one of the wealthiest men in America. His wealth nurtured his natural instinct for philanthropy. And in this field, his contributions have been equal to his money-making activities, considerable and substantial. He tells his life story in a new autobiography, I Couldn't Put It Down, entitled I Love Capitalism, an American Story, in which he tells us he has never forgotten who he is and where he poignantly expresses thanks to all who helped him along the way. It is my privilege to welcome Ken Langone to the program. Jim, thanks for having me on. Well, I'm delighted to have you. Now, Ken, uh, you had many offers over the years to write a book. Yes. And uh, you didn't. No. Nope. And then recently you decided to write one. What, what made you decide to write this book? Well, it, the, the real impetus for the book was actually two years after uh, the idea really gelled. And, and how it happened was I was out at the Allen Conference in Sun Valley on a machine, on an exercise machine, and a chap comes over to me, a well-known chap. I know who he was. I didn't think he knew who I was. And he said, you ought to write a book. It was Michael Ovitz. And I said, I know who you are. You don't even know who I am. He said, oh, yeah, I know who you are, and you should write a book. And I said, well, thank you very much, but I said, I'm not writing a book. The following week, Random House a representative of a random house called me up and said he wanted to come see me. And it was obviously Michael Ovitz had mentioned to him and he, Adrian Zackheim. And he came and I said, look, I appreciate it. I'm flattered, but it's not my thing. Thanks. Anyway, long story short, they came back over two or three times over that period, next couple of years, and I kept saying no. Two years ago in January, January of 16, I was late at night. I was just getting ready to get in bed and I had the television on. And I'm watching Bernie Sanders and what he's saying. And what he said to me uh, really didn't impact me because I felt like nobody would go for that. But as I looked around the crowd, it was all young people. And I said, my God, if these people give up on what brought us to the party, if these people give up on the greatness of America and what the basis of that greatness is, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to be Venezuela. We're going to be Argentina. We're going to be Cuba. You name it. And uh, so the next day I called up Adrian and I said, I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I'd like to talk to you and give you some thoughts. And we ultimately settled on the fact that it would be a story that would demonstrate my love of capitalism and more importantly, the benefits of capitalism, not just for me, but for all the people that I had the good fortune to be part of or them be part of me. And uh, so it's, I'd like to feel like it's as much a celebration of this country, and that's why I call it an American story as a subtitle, because it really is a tribute to this great country, more than me. So how about Mike Ovitz? Did you have to pay him a commission? Paid him nothing. He came to the book party. Uh, he's, he's a wonderful supporter, and I appreciate it. And uh, I will tell you, Jim, in the spirit of candor, about two weeks before the book came out, I was terrified. I was absolutely, oh my God, this has got a bomb and I'm going to look like a fool, and I'm going to look like an ego, old egomaniac that wants to tell a story that nobody wants to hear about. And so I was very concerned that what would happen. Well, for whatever reason, maybe I hit a nerve, maybe it was the right time, and whatever it was, the book's doing very well, thank God. Well, it's a wonderful story. So tell us about your beginnings as you describe them in the book. Extremely humble origins. Dad was a plumber, eighth grade education, mom worked in a school cafeteria, seventh grade education, humble but loving and, and uh, just totally dedicated to their family. I say in the book that the best gift I got from them was this unconditional love that was always mine from them and my brother too. Uh, were you the first in your family to finish high school and, and uh, No, no. Uh, probably there were a lot of cousins, a lot of family. I might have been the eighth or ninth to finish high school and maybe one of the two or three that went to college. But the first in your immediate family? First in my immediate family. And my, bro no, my brother graduated from high school five years before me and I have a, a one or two cousins that were older than me, they graduated from high school, but they, none of them went to college. Now it was always uh, your mother's dream and possibly your father's as well that you go to college and that you finish college. My parents, they just felt it was important that I have an education and that I give everything, my, all my effort 
be 100%. Because that's how they were. They, they had very humble origins. They had no educational background. But whatever they did, they did with passion and belief. My dad, his whole goal in life was to be the best plumber he could be. Mom, same thing. Mom went in the kitchen. You damn right better be ready for a competitive environment because she's going to make the best pasta and the best brush all and whatever else we had. So there was, a, there was a commitment to do the best you can. I think you have a story that you had some uh, screwy teacher in high school who thought you weren't college material. Oh, my you, principal. The principal, principal of my high school. And, and uh, it, it absolutely devastated your mother. Uh, uh, tell that one. The night I graduated from high school it was a Monday night. 1953. Mom had worked in the school cafeteria, the grammar school cafeteria, but all the teachers knew Mom because whenever Mom made an Italian dish for the kids, they would all go to her school to eat because it was so good, all the teachers, so from the high school and so forth. And so Mom's waiting for the ceremony to start, and the principal comes up to Mom and says, you know, he's called, her Mom was Angelita, everybody called her Angie. And he said, you know, Angie, you and your husband work so very hard for the little you have. I'd be less than honest if I didn't tell you that Ken's not college material and he's probably not going to make it. She said, what do you mean? He said, well, she says, I wouldn't be surprised if he was out by Christmas. So the, I, all the, the custom used to be we'd all go to Montauk Point after graduation, and typical what kids did. And the next day I came home and I walked into the living room of this little house we lived in. And mom's sitting on the sofa crying. And my first thought was somebody died. And I said, Mom, who died? She said, oh, nobody died. I said, what are you crying for then? <laughs> she said, well, Mr. Ross told me last night that you're going to flunk out of college. What do you mean? She, yeah, she said, you're not college material and you're going to be out of college by Christmas. I said, Mom, I promise you that won't happen. Now, truthfully, I worked like hell to make his prophecy come true. <laughs> I worked like hell in a sense. I didn't do anything in my studies. And I was having a great time, and the likelihood was that I probably would have washed out at the end of the first semester. You were at Bucknell. I was at Bucknell. Now, wasn't there a teacher there who uh, uh, that's had an extraordinary influence on you? Huge influence. His name was Russell Headley. He was the professor. He was the, the chairman of the Department of Economics. And uh, we, had, we had four or five subsections of the, of the, program, of the uh, course, fresh basic Economics 101. The book we used, the textbook, was Paul Samuelson's textbook. They still use it in college. They still use it. It's a wonderful book. And on Saturdays, he, he ran a combined class. All the sections met on Saturday. We used to have classes on Saturday morning. And he'd be up on the stage talking about whatever it was that he wanted to cover. And he used to throw a, a, text at, a test at us every once in a while. And a couple of weeks before this particular Saturday, he gave us a test, and I wrote it down, and we handed it in, and at the end of this class, he said, is there a Mr. Lang going in the room? And I said, oh, my God. I raised my hand. He said, I want to see you after class. So I said, okay. So I went into his office, and I'm thinking, what the hell did I do? I'm, I'm not doing it very well to start with. I'm flunking every one of my subjects. And he, 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 I get in his office, and he sits down, and he says, have a seat. And he takes my exam book and he throws it on the table. And he said, that's the worst English I've ever read in my life. He said, I can't believe. He said, uh, I struggled to figure out what the hell you were saying. And he said, I'm glad I did. Because he said, you really get the subject very well. He said, uh, tell me something. How are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, how are you doing in your other classes? I said, about as good as I'm doing in yours. He said, well, that means you're going to be out of here in January. And I hmm. said, yeah, I guess that's right. That wasn't very good. <laughs> no, I was getting F's and everything, including ROTC. And uh, I was having a good time, Jim. And he said to me, is that what you want to happen? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, if you're willing to make an effort from now on, this is Thanksgiving, the semester ended at the end of January. That's when they used to have the, you come back after Christmas break and you had three or four more weeks of classes. He said, if I'm willing to reach out to all your other professors and see if we can pull you out of this nosedive, can we count on you doing everything you can to help us? I said, absolutely, because I didn't want to, I knew what it would have meant to my mother, especially my dad as well. So he said to me, uh, okay, and the rest is history. Well, you tell another story about uh, Bucknell where you, uh, and certainly it was a financial sacrifice for your parents to send Big you time. there. 
Big time. And uh, that you needed $300 to uh, continue, well, and, and something happened. Tell us about well, that. Well, what happened was Elena and I decided to get married after my junior year. So I would have had one year left in college, married. My dad was really upset. My dad, typical macho Italian, you take a wife, you're responsible for your wife. So he said to me, we're going to give you what we can as if you're there for the whole year, but what you don't have is your problem. We can't do anything about it. You want to get married, we've got to have an apartment, and two of us eating instead of one of us, you know. And uh, I said, okay. And I, so I went up to Bucknell before the semester started, and I went into the dean's office, and I said to him that unless I could take two semesters in one, I'd have to drop out because I wasn't going to have enough money for the second semester. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'm married and uh, I want to finish, but I don't have enough money for the tuition and room and board for my wife and me and the expenses we would have, a little car we had and so forth. And he said, what do you want? And I said, well, is there any way I can take two semesters in one? And I had never been to a summer school, so all, all the courses I took were within the school year. He said, well, you know, he said, that's going to be tough. And I said, I know it's going to be tough, but sir, I said, if you don't give me that choice, I'm going to leave now. I'm not going to. So the worst thing that happens if I flunk, at least I gave it a shot. He says, you got it. So I thank him. His name was uh, Coleman. He was the dean, dean of uh, the university. And he wrote a book on world literature that we used in my sophomore year in, in a world literature course, he and Harry Robbins. And on the way out of his office, his assistant, who was really a closet boss, she, she had a lot of influence and power. Her name was Martha Henderson. How'd it go? I said, fine. I said, he's going to let me do it. But I said, I got a problem. She said, what's your problem? And I said, well, I'm short 300 bucks. I said, I figured it all out. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm going to be able to work everything out, but I'm still dragging 300 hours. She said, well, I think we can figure a way out to help you with that, because that's, she had influence. And sure enough, Buck now loaned me 300 hours, and the rest is history. Well, you paid them back the three hundred dollars. I've given them a lot more than three hundred. A lot more than three hundred dollars. But I've never paid them back. <laughs> okay, you understand? You know, you know. Something my dad used to say at a point in your life when somebody does something for you, that's pivotal. No matter how much you do to reflect gratitude and how much you do to try and pay them back, you never can. Well, you probably paid them back because you're the most distinguished alumnus with that. With that well, I, uh, let me say this to you. I'm not sure I'm the most distinguished alumnus, uh, but I do know that Elaine and I have been extremely generous with Bucknell. Generous in the sense that we have it. We, the first thing we did is, uh, as a surprise to Elaine, because she was 18 when we got married, I had the university center named after her, and then years later I had, we made a major donation to build the athletic center, which is really world class. And more recently, I started the scholarship program for kid, kids who show, demonstrate some capacity to give back. And uh, we have 38 kids at Bucknell right now that receive some amount of money every year from us towards their education. You observe in the book that uh, if you uh, had to uh, identify the people who helped you along the way, it would uh, fill Yankee Stadium. That's uh, 52,000 people. More than, uh, yeah, more than fill Yankee More than 52,000 people. There's 350, there's 400,000 people at Home Depot alone. Yeah. Okay? Every one of them. In their own way, every single day, what they do to give our customers a wonderful experience contributed to my success. Well, then they're the people who, then work, who work for the manufacturers the, that, that are, whose goods are sold. In precisely, Home precisely. And then there's the people that helped me through college. And then there's the people I want to work with. Then there's people in the Army that I was in the Army with that had a meaningful impact on my life. So, you know, my point is simple. I'm not self-made. I am the beneficiary of the hard work and the sincere effort of a lot of people to help me along the way. And I'm not suggesting for a minute there aren't self-made people. I'm simply saying I'm not self-made. My parents, my aunts and my uncles, my immediate family, uh, my kids, my wife. You know, when you, when you start realizing all the people in your life that impact you, your friends. You know. Well, it's unusual, particularly because uh, most authors uh, have an acknowledgement section at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. You have yours at the beginning of the book. And, yeah, you, the, and you list uh, at least 224 people, mm -hmm. by my count, 
who helped you along the way. My life story would not have happened without the benefit of a lot of other people helping me, whether it was Ross Perot or Tom Marcus from EDS or all the people at EDS, whether it was Bernie Marcus or Arthur Blank, all the companies. They were your co-founders at home. Oh, yeah, but like, like Derek Smith at Choice Point when we merged our company with his and the great job he did in leadership. So I go on and Gary Earlbaum in Philadelphia, a dear friend of mine of 40-some years, virtually everything I've done, Gary's been involved with. So what I'm saying, Jim, is that in, in the cold light of day, I am the beneficiary of the efforts of a whole lot of other people. Now, I hope that in my efforts, I help them as well. But that doesn't take away from the fact that I feel some sense of obligation and some sense of gratitude to them for the impact they had on my life. Well, that was also true of your education because Same thing. Uh, you worked for Equitable. They sent you to NYU Business School at right, night. Right. And then you wound up teaching at NYU Business right. School. Right. That was a remarkable comeback from, from my mother being told in 1953 that I wasn't going to graduate from college to teaching at the U, and it was then called the School of Commerce, Accounts, and Finance at NYU in 1960, teaching. So I've gone from seven years, I'm going, to be at, I'm going to be thrown out of college seven years ago, to now fast forward seven years, and here I am teaching courses in the night program at NYU, which was a very important part of my development. Well, you had a, uh, uh, a rocket-like uh, business uh, career on Wall Street, mm. uh, and uh, you became the president of mm -hmm. uh, your firm, Pressbrick, right. and you went out and had your own firm. And uh, then you were the co-founder of uh, Home Depot, and you uh, wound up uh, uh, being a billionaire. Well, you left out one thing. I had this rocket meteoric rise, and then about 1970, I had this mediocre dive. Well, that happens on Wall Street. Well, I understand, but it really was severe for me. So here I am. That's the capitalist system. Well, that's win or lose. That's what it's all about. Yeah. You know, you don't have any trouble knowing at the end of the day, at that point, I was a failed capitalist. You know, market had crashed. We were having terrible times in the country. Remember Kent State and remember the the the, uh, the riots and, and the demonstrations regarding the Vietnam. I mean, we were never, in my opinion, more divided as a nation than we were in that period of time. So, yeah, but, but that's how capitalism works. You know, it's it's not a single trajectory in one direction. You know, you get setbacks. And, and uh, I was blessed with some resolve that, okay, I took a big hit. Now, now we're going to see how good I am. Well, and uh, then you turn to philanthropy. Philanthropy later, although, let me say this to you. In my life's experience in my family, my mom and dad, with very, very little in the way of uh, discretionary resources, practically none, I, I always saw my mother and father, whatever little bit they had, what they could do to contribute what we call philanthropy, they call donations or charity. Charity. And, and whether it was mom feeding somebody who needed a meal or whether it was dad going and doing something for somebody, plumbing and not billing him because the guy couldn't afford to pay him. I mean, there's, we have all different forms of philanthropy. The thing that, interestingly enough, to this question, Jim, the first money I gave Bucknell of any consequence, which was then... I thought a lot of money today in the context of what we've done, you lose it in the rounding. It was, and we, were, we always went to mom and dad's for lunch every Sunday with the kids. That was, that's why I love this television show, Blue Bloods. They have the family together every Sunday for lunch, and that brings back my childhood. And so we went to mom's, and uh, Elaine, the kids were all sitting at the table, and mom and dad, Elaine and me. And Elaine says, tell pop up. That's what we call my dad, the kids call him. Tell Pop Pop what we did for Bucknell. My father loved Bucknell. My father, one of the great joys in his life was to say his son graduated from Bucknell. And I think a lot of my affection for the place emanates from that. So I, well, I said, Dad, Elaine and I, we're doing pretty good. And we decided we wanted to do something to help Bucknell. And we did that. I didn't tell him what the amount was. And he said to me, uh, he put his fork down. I'll never forget it. And he said, well, where'd you go with that? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you gave him that. I said, yeah. And he said, but what'd you give up? I said, I gave up nothing. What are you talking about? And he looked at me and he said, remember this. He said, it's only when you go without something yourself to give to somebody else that it's real charity. But by that standard, Jim, I'm not very philanthropic. 
I've given nothing up in my life. Well, look at this marvelous uh, medical facility known yeah. as NYU Langone. Right. Uh, but again, was, I didn't give up anything. Was really down on its heels when uh, you came into. Well, the it was it was in a ditch, and, and <laughs> but guess That's what? even worse than down on its had, heels. It had the most precious thing of all. It had fabulous professionals doing their work. They had doctors and nurses. This is I can't stress enough the quality of the professional staff and the nurses and everybody in the place. That's what I saw. I said, wait a minute, this is going to be easy. The hard part's done. The people are here. The talent is here. The commitment, the passion, the dedication. Hell, I, this is made for me. Well, you started off with an anonymous gift of $100 million. Mm -hmm. Then you gave another $100 million. Mm -hmm. They named it after you. Well, the anonymous gift was nine years before the second gift. And when Bob Grossman took over as dean, I thought I'd... Elaine and I would make a commitment to jumpstart it, and Elaine and I both talked about it, and we agreed, you know, we can afford it. And back to what I said, we didn't give a thing up, Jim. Beautiful homes, you know, all the things you could want in life, we had them all, and we didn't sacrifice. So when we gave the second gift, they came to me and said, look, we think it's important that we identify you because we think it'll, it'll lead other people to want to participate as well. And I said, look, we're not comfortable, but... If you think so. So they said, yeah, we want to do it. So I said, okay. Because it had been nine years since the first gift. And guess what, Jim? They were right. I and mean, we've raised, we've raised in 19 years, we've raised $2.8 billion for philanthropy. $2.8 billion. For NYU. And all, all for a project that you seeded, really. Well, I was there. I, they saw, I, I mean, be, take credit where credit's due. No, still. but Jim, the real credit belongs to the talent that was in the place. Buildings are easy to be, you need the money to build them, but buildings are fairly easy things to do. Getting people that were passionate, that were competent, that were dedicated to their profession, they were there. They were all there. This is what blew my mind. The hard part was over. This, this was made for me, raising some money and putting some buildings up. You also joined Bill Gates in uh, something called the Giving Pledge, where uh, mm -hmm. leading... Uh, members of the community uh, pledged to give at least half of their assets. Uh, well, when Warren called me about it. It's a I, charity. So, uh, yes, tell about that. I said, Warren, Warren Buffett. Yeah. We've already done it. You know, <laughs> forget about the pledge. We've done it. <laughs> right. And he said, well, it would be nice. I said, fine. I'm happy to sign the pledge. It's, it's academic. I can prove, you know, whatever we've got, thank God. And it's more than we ever thought we'd ever have. Whatever we've got. Happy to give away here, and indeed, most of the largest portion of our net worth is going to charity, far more than half. Now, your book uh, is really a love song to capitalism. Amen. Uh, amen. And uh, you certainly don't like the socialism of uh, Bernie Sanders, but you signed on to something uh, that had to do with uh, income inequality. Yep. And uh, how do you reconcile those two? Very easy. Income inequality leads to social unrest. If you look at what happened in Cuba in the 50s, when the gap between the rich and the poor got so wide and the poor gave up, the, the ground is fertile for a Fidel Castro to show up and to say, you follow me and I'll do everything I can to make sure that you're treated more fairly. That hasn't happened. That hasn't happened at all. The rich are gone, the poor are there, they're still poor and they still struggle. Venezuela is a better example. Now, Jim, there's two parts to the equation. Though. The one part is income inequality, the other part is education. I'm terrified, yay, yes, about the gap, the income inequality gap, but I'm equally terrified, Jim, by the deplorable condition public education is in America. I'm a product of a great public school education. I tell people, as hard as I fought not to get an education at Rosin, Rosin schools, I got one. You know, As bad as my English was, I could read and I could write and I could count. And I could, with some development, I could catch up. But a poor kid that graduates today with a fourth or fifth grade competency in reading or math, he's buried or she's buried. So, so yes, and I'm passionate about income inequality. And I'm very proud to say this. Home Depot has never, ever hired one person for minimum wage. We've always paid a premium over minimum wage, and we try to move them along. And in fact, Jim, let me take this moment to brag. One of the greatest 
marks of Home Depot success, in my opinion. We have 3,000 young people that came to work for us in the parking lot. That's entry level, pushing carts in and helping people load up their cars. 3,000 of them that are multimillionaires today. Capitalism works. Capitalism works. So I have a question for you, yep. Ken Langone, because we're drawing to a close. Go ahead. And my question is, what do you see as your legacy? Oh, boy. Uh, a happy family. You know, a, a, a maniacal devotion to country. This country. There'll never be another American. Every morning when I put this on, Jim, every single morning, I look up to the ceiling and I, as if I'm talking to my grandparents because I know they're in heaven. I say, Grandma and Grandpa, thanks for coming to America. Ken Langone, you've helped immeasurably making it the greatest country on earth, and thank you so much Jim, for coming by. I'm honored to be asked. Thank you so much. Oh, well, we're honored that you're here, and thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.